Okay, thanks everyone for joining us, those here and those watching us on YouTube, both now and those who will tune in later to watch. Uh, my name is Joey Lovestrand. I'm a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at SOAS, University of London, and pleased to have us in our webinar today, Dr. Nick Health Freeman. Nick is the reader in sign languages and deaf studies at the University of Central Lancashire. So I always uh, pronounce British place names with a bit of trepidation because I'm never sure how they're actually pronounced. Uh, he's also co-director of the Islands Institute, the International Institute for Sign Languages and Deaf Studies. Uh, I've presented uh, twice at conferences where Nick is also presenting. First one was about two years ago, but at that time I was recovering from a foot injury and wasn't very mobile and missed Nick's presentation. So I was fortunate that earlier this year, at the beginning of this year, we were again presenting at the same conference. And that's when I finally got to see a bit of what Nick's work actually looks like. And it was yeah, really interesting to see uh, what he's been doing and what we can all learn through the work that he's been doing. Um, and so I was yeah, excited to have the opportunity to hear more from Nick today. Nick's work fits in pretty well with a lot of things we're interested in at SOAS also. Uh, obviously, SOAS has been very involved in language documentation for a long time. And so the work Nick does uh, documenting Indonesian sign language, which is interesting both for the content of the corpus he makes, uh, but also for the methodology he uses, and we can learn from that. And of course, SOAS has also been interested in Indonesia for a long time as well. It's a uh, place where you can learn Indonesian uh, in your, uh, as part of your degree, perhaps the only university in UK where that happens. I'm not sure if there's any other universities teaching Indonesian. And of course, we have uh, people studying all aspects of uh, Indonesian culture and society. And so seeing what Nick can bring in terms of you know, new aspects of Indonesian society is also interesting to us. Um, so we're interested to, to hear about what you've been doing and learn from uh, your work. Um, I'll just remind everyone in case you missed it in the presentation that Nick will be presenting in British Sign Language. And we're very fortunate that Sarah will be here interpreting for those of us who don't know BSL, so we have an English interpretation. Uh, Nick will speak for about 40 or 45 minutes, and then we'll save some time at the end of this hour together for questions. Uh, if you, any questions come to mind during or while listening to this talk, you can put that into the chat or if you're watching on YouTube, make a comment on the YouTube video. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll try to get to as many of your questions as we have time for at the end. With that being said, thank you so much, Nick, for joining us. And we look forward to uh, hearing from what you have to share today. Thank you very much. Can I just check? Um, yeah, can everybody see me OK? Just checking the interpreter can see me as well. So. Um, Thank you very much, Joey, for that introduction. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today presenting this afternoon. And really, I've been doing this work for 10 years with the deaf uh, community and deaf friends in Indonesia. So I've been gathering this corpus in sign language in Indonesia for a, a period of time. So I was thinking how best to represent that and show you the work, the extensive work that I've been doing over this uh, period of time. And I thought the best way would be to pick five clips, um, which is why it's entitled as it is today, uh, the corpus in five clips. But first of all, just a little brief introduction. I know Joey has um, given a little bit of an introduction and explained that I'm from the Islands Institute. Um, and that was set up in 2007. And that was really to look at um, research in international um, communities, deaf communities. But also we wanted to look at the impact as well. It was, it was useful to look at the um, research that we were doing and also the impact that that was having. So we were looking at India um, and Indonesia. So we uh, established PUPET, uh, which you can hopefully see on that slide there. Um, and that was with an aim to really doing lots of research work. 
It was established in 2014 with a colleague of mine called Mohammed, and the three aims you can see there, it was really to do some sign language research, um, sign language teaching, and look at the teaching capacity and improve that capacity, and also try to improve literacy in Indonesia for deaf children. So really, um, this presentation, I was um, talking to Mohammed, I was discussing it with Mohammed beforehand, and he has actually recorded um, uh, his various views and uh, opinions, uh, which I've managed to capture. So I would like to introduce Mohammed to you, and um, I will incorporate those throughout the PowerPoint. I tried to actually incorporate them within the PowerPoint, but there seemed to be some kind of software breakdown. Um, so what I'm going to have to do is to switch between PowerPoint and um, showing you the video footage through some of the means. So um, please all start praying now that this video is going to work as it should, whilst I get the first clip of Mohammed to show to you so you, he can introduce himself to you. So my name is Mohammed and this is my sign name. I'm from Solo in central Java. I remember that Nick and I first met in 2009. And at that time, Nick was a volunteer with VSO. We talked and I found out that he's from England. Then Nick came back to Indonesia as a researcher, looking at sign language varieties in different Indonesian cities. He was filming people signing and I saw this. I was interested and decided to join his projects. So hopefully that all runs smoothly and you could see that all okay. And there'll be more from Mohammed later throughout this presentation. But I think it's important um, that we have this awareness of Basindo first. So I introduced Basindo to you. So Basindo was developed, um, you know, we don't really know exactly when. And we, we've tried to look for evidence, but there's no records as such as to when it was introduced. But we know that the first deaf school was established in the 1930s. So that means that we have knowledge that at that time there were deaf children who were educated together. Do we know if the teacher used sign language? No, we don't. Um, but we do know that socially or maybe, um, you know, in dormitories or in other non-formal settings, sign language was developing. And it's possible that it was around before then as well. We just don't know. So the name Basindo um, was given to the language in 2000, in 2000 um, by an organization called Gerketin. And it's the Indonesian Association for the Welfare of the Deaf. And they um, gave Basindo its name. Um, so the name was actually given many years later after the language had already been developed. But there are some questions linked with um, language delineation. So was it one sign language? Were there many different sign languages at that time? So the Basindo corpus um, altogether there were 131 signers from six different regions in Indonesia. Um, and you can see there the photos uh, of the people who were involved. We have dyads, triads, and tetrads. Um, and it was free conversation. So we were eliciting that free conversation from people. And sometimes if there was no appropriate partner or interlocutor, the researcher would actually lend a hand and be part of that conversation and elicit 
the natural conversation from another interpreter. So um, altogether, there's nine hours of um, corpus of, of natural conversation, um, of signed conversation. So altogether, there are 46,091 signs that you can see within that corpus. So now we're trying to find, um, a, a, a working on a lexical database, similar to a dictionary, if you like, which means that um, each sign will have its own gloss, um, its own name will be put against uh, that sign. And that's obviously a huge piece of work and it's not easy. So um, we're, you know, we're, we're working on that, but it's a, at a slow pace, obviously, because it's an enormous piece of work. So you can see there with the, um, you can see with the corpus, the sample stratification. Um, if I, we can see by gender, uh, there were people from different places. And also there were people of different ages, you can see there as well. I think there's, I've got this slide up there, but I just wanted to show you this, the six different areas, because this is really important for, um, for the corpus itself, for people to know. So we've got Padang, uh, Pontinac, Solo, Makassar, Singara, and Ambon um, with the six areas we went to elicit that data. Okay, so there were two stages of, of doing this. So first of all, we went to uh, Solo and Makassar um, and that was 2010 to 2015. And that was at the period of time that we collected the data. And then the second stage was 2016 to 2019 from Ambon, Pontinac, Singara, and Padang. Um, so, yeah, and I must say a huge thank you to the um, funders as well, um, the Levin's Hume Trust and CBM. Um, huge thank you to them. Uh, if I hadn't had that funding, then this would not have been possible. So it's important to acknowledge their part in this as well. So the six geographical re regions we, we chose um, because we wanted to represent Indonesia and we wanted to represent this, these different geographical areas. We didn't want to just focus on one specific area. Maybe you know Indonesia is a huge, vast country of many, many islands. Um, and there is a huge difference in terms of culture, in terms of religion, and many people's spoken language is actually very different as well. So it was very important to recognize that and in doing that, find a balance and elicit the data from um, a, an array of different places, which is why we chose those six areas. And it was linked with, um, you know, most people I had met people from those places before. So there were people I knew but I want to go back a little bit to the table. So I'll just go back there. Um, because you can see the age ranges, the categories, the groupings that we have there, the four groupings. So you can see there, um, most of them are over a 10 year period, but the early group, if you like the oldest of the groups, they span a 30 year period. Um, so older people, there, it was, there were very few um, and it was very hard to find those older people and those older sign language users to be part of the corpus. Um, so now I'm going to bring Mohammed back again um, and he's going to talk about why it was hard to find some of these older sign language users. Um, and he'll also um, talk about our experience of, of looking for deaf people um, to participate in this. You know, in city areas, it was quite uh, easy, but in more rural parts, it was more difficult. So I'll, I'll hand over to Mohammed to explain that to you. And then Mohammed um, will talk about some of these different regions and what his experience of when he met people, whether he could understand them or whether there was any miscommunication or communication difficulties. Okay, so there's a few different clips here from Mohammed. Oh, 
But first I was helping to find deaf people. We wanted to recruit signers of different ages to take part. But it wasn't easy to find older signers. We had to go and find them because they didn't want to come to the place where we'd been doing the filming. So we had to ask around and find out where they lived and then ask them if they wanted to take part in the filming. I noticed a difference in how easy it was to communicate with some older signers. Because when they were young, there were no deaf schools. So I felt there was more variation among the older signers that we met. When we went to Pontinac, the deaf community was very well networked. Some friends sent an SMS round and the deaf people gathered together in one place for filming. It was the same in Padang and in Singara. There was a place where deaf people came together. But in Ambon, things were quite different. The deaf people didn't seem together and we had quite a search on our hands to find people. We tried to use a snowball method. Sometimes we were told that there was a deaf person in a certain place, but there was no one there. And Bonn has had no local deaf association, which might help to explain this. We had to travel to places that were far away, up in the hills, very far away, nowhere close by at all. My experience of communicating with people in these cities was that many of their signs were the same as mine. If someone used a sign I didn't know, I would ask what it meant. But in general, their dialects were intelligible to me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you to uh, Sarah there. I think the text was coming up quite fast. So, um, so I want to explain a little bit about the background of the corpus as well. Um, so now it's time to dive into it <laughs> and have a look at these clips, uh, as I promised, as I would represent the corpus in these five clips. I'm aware that maybe you are aware of the background of sign language linguistics or maybe not so much. Um, so I'll just, you know, go through it a little bit to help you understand it, certainly at a superficial level. Um, so when I start talking about manual alphabets, um, most of the world of, of sign language has manual alphabets. And maybe you, uh, maybe when you were younger, maybe you learnt some uh, of your own manual alphabet. Um, and I think many people uh, use the, the manual alphabet and it's their first contact with sign language through the alphabet. In Indonesian sign language, it's quite interesting because the manual alphabet, there isn't just one, but there are two. So there's Basindo alphabet and there's also the ASL alphabet. So if we go back, there's two-handed uh, Basindo and one-handed, which is the ASL. So Basindo alphabet, I believe um, it was introduced by the Dutch, um, by a Dutch teacher or Dutch teachers, um, but because we found some similarities um, with the alphabet in the Netherlands and also in Germany as well. So I think the teachers thought we need a way when they were over there in Indonesia, whenever it was to teach literacy. Um, and they, they introduced the alphabet to Indonesia. And then the ASL alphabet was introduced in the 1980s uh, and that was from America. And then it became um, incorporated by the government. Um, they, they established a dictionary and they used SIBI and I'll just explain what um, SIBI is. It's, it's completely different to Basindo. It was created really through a committee and it follows the Indonesian spoken language grammar. So it follows the same order of grammar um, used in spoken Indonesian. And the alphabet really um, gained popularity and spread throughout Indonesia, the ASL alphabet. 
But if you can just have a look at this slide, you've got the six different places there. And you can see in the blue, which is Basindo, the Basindo manual alphabet. And you've got the orange, which is ASL, the ASL manual alphabet. And um, I checked the corpus to look at how many for each of the different regions, the six regions, uh, we're using Basindo and ASL. So you can see that's represented in the graph there. And it's um, it's quite impactful, I think, this um, uh, slide, because it shows you the variety, because in, in Makassar, there's a lot of Basindo, and in Ambon, you've got a huge amount of ASL. And the reason for that, I think, is linked to education primarily, but also for Ambon, um, some people will know there was a, a war, a civil war in Ambon. Um, and at that time, it had an impact on the deaf community. Some people fled the region and Mohammed said that the deaf people there didn't really have any kind of organization, any community. Um, so the language um, transmission, if you like, was broken. So I think that's why there's a strength of ASL and the influence of ASL is even more um, marked in Ambon um, from young people who've, who've not learnt Basindo from the um, older community members. And I think that's why there's such a stark difference there. So altogether, um, you know, in terms of how many signs there are um, based on the manual alphabet, um, there's 4.5% of signs based on the manual alphabet. Um, some hearing people think sign language is the same as the manual alphabet, it's exactly the same, and it's really not. Um, so that's just one small part um, of this work. And the manual alphabet is used in lots of different ways, there's lots of different strategies, if you like, which are represented on this slide. It could be the full word, finger spelling the full word. It could be fingers, it could be spelling the first letter of the word. So um, for example, BSL, Monday uh, is M for that. This is the BSL for Monday, which is M initialization. Um, then the third way could be to spell, you know, using two or three letters, um, taking those from the words. And I'll give you an example of that later. Or the fourth way could be using, I've called it initialization, using a hand shape of a letter from a particular sign. So an example of that would be from American Sign Language, the sign for family, if you can see here. If I use the F shape, that's family. That's the sign for family. But you can change the F to an S and it becomes society. The S you could change to a T and it becomes team. So you can see family, society and team. So you can see that's all through using the same um, location and using the same hand movements but different different hand shapes and it's the initialization using that particular initialization to convey that. So drum roll please, <laughs> uh, we have our first clip. So finally you may be thinking, um, this is a person from Padang. And at that time of filming, I think she, this lady was in her early 70s. Um, so first of all, I will show you the clip and I won't tell you what it means. I'll just show you first of all, it's very brief. So twice she signs this. Um, and it's quite interesting for me because the first time I saw the clip, I thought, I don't understand that. I don't really know what she's saying. And the same with Mohammed, um, who's a native Indonesian sign language user. And then later we watched it again and we realized the meaning of it. 
So I'll show it you again. And then I'll explain what it means. So Ibu, Ibu, it's mother, mother. And she's using this, Ibu, Ibu. And it's from three letters, I, B, U, uh, I, B, and U. But over time, those three letters have changed to this movement. Um, they've morphed into this this one movement. So, but it actually means I B U Ibu uh, from the word mother. And this process is called uh, nativization. Um, and maybe you know, if you're doing research into spoken languages, you'll know it well. A word could be borrowed from a particular language and then uh, nativized. Uh, into a spoken language because it, it, and it and it's changed in that in that way. So if you think about Indonesian spoken language, the word for computer um, has been taken, um, and the pronunciation has been taken to match the phonetics of the um, Indonesian spoken alpha, uh, spoken language. So it's the same process for sign language. Sign language has its own phonetics, and that's linked with the for example, hand movement and um, sign shape. And the three letters, I, B, U, I, B, and U. It doesn't really match sign language phonology very well. So you can see that this process has taken place of nativization. And it's a similar process that happens for other words as well. For example, for milk and for teacher and bankrupt. So it's the same process. So if you take the um, teacher, the Indonesian for teacher, the written word guru, G-U-R-U. And it's become this. So that's everything, G-U-R-U, incorporated into that uh, sign. So it's been nativized. And Padang um, also, there's a, a tendency to pick three letters, um, two or three letters from a word. So for example, word, uh, the word year is signed like this. So T-N or the word Sunday, like this, M and G. And I want to have a look at the different age groups at this point. Um, I've talked about the four different um, strategies for using the manual alphabet. And if you look now, the oldest group here use um, many of those uh, different ways that I've shown you. You know, they'll use the two or three letters. The, the, you can see the red there um, is, is quite dominant. But then the younger group of sign language users, you can see there's very, there's a negligible amount, very tiny amount of using that particular strategy. Um, compared with um, initialization, which is much stronger. There are many that are using initialization and you can see that in the light blue at the, the final bar on that graph. So what do I think is happening? Well, there's been the introduction of ASL. The ASL manual alphabet was introduced. And I think in some way that thwarted the growth of those, um, the two-handed um, Basindo alphabet. But it's possible that there'll be a change back to using Basindo because now people have become more aware of what's going on in terms of their history, that they have this two-handed alphabet, then ASL, ASL infiltrated and they may well say, well, we don't want ASL, we want to go back to using Basindo. So it'll be quite interesting to observe what will happen over the coming years. 
Okay, so we'll move on now to the second clip. Um, so it's important for you to know that um, in terms of sign language, you use hand shapes, you can use orientation, location and movement to convey meaning. So um, I was doing um, a study on completions. So it, that was in Solo and also Makassar. And I found four different forms for completed particles. Um, but also it's, it's possible to show mouthings as well, to, use, uh, to express the completion using mouthing, mouthings from the Indonesian spoken word. So I'll now show you the four forms of the completed particles. So if you see, this is one, two, three, and four. So there are four different completed particles. So now I'll show you the second clip, and this is from Makassar. Um, and it's important that you know, um, in sign language, um, there are various different articulators that you can use at the same time simultaneously. So I was checking the corpus to try and find a really good example of this, of completives. And I found this particular example. I think this is really interesting. So I want to ask if you can pick up how many different artic articulators there are, how many times um, the completives are used, and if you can pick up what's happening. So it's just to give you a little bit of background, she's talking about her brothers and her sisters. Um, have they been on pilgrimage um, for, to the Hajj pilgrimage? Uh, or have they not yet been? So she's talking about which of the siblings have or have not been. So I'll just let you view that clip. I think maybe I'll show you again. It's quite fast. So maybe you've captured, um, the, there are three different um, articulators that she's using at the same time. So on her left hand, she's saying, she's counting, she's saying these siblings, um, the brothers and sisters, the first, the oldest, the second, the third, and so on. And she's going in order of age. And then this that she's doing is showing the pilgrimage um, the pilgrimage, she's showing that, expressing that on her uh, head. And then she's mouthing the Indonesian word as well for finished. Uh, suda, suda, or already done. So at the same time, there's three um, in one, if you like. And I think that's, this is absolutely fascinating. So I'll show you one more time. I think that's it's just amazing how much information is crammed in to this, you know, short clip at the same amount of time. The coordination of using her right hand, left hand, the movement that she's doing around her head and also um, that articulation on the mouth as well, the mouthing is amazing. I'm going to go straight on to clip three now, um, because it, the topic's the same. We're talking about completives. So um, this clip, if you have a look at the mouthings, there are different variations of mouthings to, um, to convey that something has been completed. And there's also different uh, variation apparent. So I will show this clip. So have a look. Just watch it um, and you'll see when those signs are cropping up. Some are being used very, very quickly 
um, over and again. So um, that clip there, uh, there's two good friends from Indonesia having that chat. And they're talking about um, a family, someone getting married, and how many times they, they say it in that clip is 13 times. And it's 22 seconds in total. So, you know, there's real kind of persistence there. First time I saw it, I was absolutely gobsmacked. I was amazed. And I thought this is fascinating and it shows that variation so well um, and maybe you're surprised how many times it's shown but I need to inform you um, you know in terms of Indonesian culture the use of not yet or finished is really important um, and many questions so have you eaten finished or have you eaten not yet married finished or married not yet so you have to remember uh, though those questions, you know, it's finished, not yet, finished, not yet. That's very much part of Indonesian language. And if you have a look at the two interlocutors there and which variation they're using, um, you can see there that's captured just on that slide. So you can see on the right um, is mainly using the second variant. And on the left, he's using, using mainly the first variant. So also there's twi twice there's mouthings in there as well. Um, plus one time there's a fourth variant as well. So I was really interested to research this and look at persistence. Um, so in terms of variation, I wanted to understand a little bit more. So for example, uh, you know, I, I got the corpus and um, I found that 58% of the time they're using the same variant. Um, so they exhibit persistence. And of the, of the other variants, there are some switching, some changes, and that could be to match the other person, the other interlocutor, but that's rarely actually occurring. That's only happening in 9% of the corpus, 9% of the time. So we don't know if that's just um, accommodation. Um, are they accommodating? Are they trying to match the person or is it something else? Okay, so I hope um, you're all with me so far. And now we're gonna plow straight ahead to the fourth clip. So the fourth clip is linked with gesture. And um, the research shows that um, speech gesture, um, the speech gesture, gesture system um, is used. So emblems um, become fixed and they become conventionalized within particular regions, for example. So maybe, you know, in Indonesia, I'll ask you um, this gesture. What do you think this means in Indonesia, the gesture? If you are Indonesian yourself, or if you know Indonesian, um, you will know that this means mad or crazy. Um, so in English, you know, maybe an English person or a British person would see that and think, oh, means something different, means, I don't know, not sure. Um, so they wouldn't necessarily understand that. So speech gestures can be linked with a place. Um, and if you don't believe me, you go to Italy, <laughs> because there are many, many co-speech gestures that are evident in Italy. There are so many there. So these are really short little um, clips. I'm going to show you um, three uh, negative particles. And I want you to have a look at these three and try to decide which you think, which are from 
Indonesian co-speech gesture. Okay, so have a look. So the first one, the yellow one. The green one. And the purple one. Okay, so I'll let you have a look again at that. So the first one, the yellow. That's this um, movement, the green one. And the purple one. Okay, so which do you feel, which one is from spoken gesture, Indonesian spoken gesture? Well, is I've been a little bit cheeky really, because it's not just one, there's actually two of them that are derived from Indonesian co-speech. So it's, do you think it's, if you were thinking the yellow and the purple, you'd be correct. It's the yellow and the purple. Um, they are co-speech gestures from Indonesian. Um, so are they from Indonesia? Um, you know, this, this hand shape here, this, uh, this movement, the yellow one, the purple one is used in some areas, but not all areas, whereas the yellow one is used throughout Indonesia. So you can see the prevalence of the um, neg negations, negative existences there um, throughout those six locations that I mentioned I was studying. So purple's only used actually in three different places. And then there's one area you can see there in Sangara where um, they're using all three varieties. And I want to show you a clip here of this. Um, and, you know, there are lots of, um, there are, the person is displaying negatives um, and trying to explain uh, negatives, but is using um, those different variants that I've just explained to you. So you can see she's using this variant um, and she's saying, I don't have it uh, for not allowed, for um, doesn't matter. So she's using the same for three, those three different uh, occasions to convey those three different meanings. And I was thinking why some areas have some of the negations and some don't, uh, why they're not prevalent in some places. And I think to, it's, it's linked with the history um, of Hinduism and how Hinduism has spread from India because this sign is used in India and it's from Indian Sign Language. And it's also used in Cambodia as well. Um, and possibly in other locations as well, in other countries. Um, and in some areas of Indonesia, it's very strong, that use. Um, so I think it's linked very much with that because deaf people will see something visual, some gestural movement, and it will be incorporated into the sign language. Okay, we're approaching the fifth clip now. So the fifth clip's a little bit different. Um, I, at the end, I asked people who had been involved in the research and I asked them and I said, how do you feel about the research documentation work we've done? So I was a little bit surprised with their responses, but also pleased with their responses. Um, so I'll show you the clip. And also Mohammed has some extra thoughts that he adds um, linked with the impact of this research and the corpus and how it's benefited him personally. And also that through our research, 
we've been trying to look at that um, benefit and you know giving that benefit back to the deaf community in Indonesia and making it a benefit for them. So I'll show those clips now in sequence so you can see uh, what people have to say. So Sarah, um, the interpreter, a big breath, ready to um, articulate what, what's being said here. Okay, so how do you feel about the documentation work we've done was the question. Delighted, really good, I liked it, I'm very happy. I like using Elan. It's the first time I've used it. Here in Solo, we never knew about Elan before. It's good to know about it. I'm happy. The lady, I was glad to have the chance to learn some new words. Remember when we were transcribing the data in Elan? For me, it was good to be able to look at signing in depth. For example, there might be a sign that I find confusing, but with Elan, we could look at the sentence again more slowly and then it made sense at a deeper level. My experiences in the field have been very useful for me. I've been exposed to so many different variants and different ways of signing things from men and women, older signers, younger signers, different styles and ways of using the sign space. I learned such a lot. Now I interpret on one of the television news channels. I've met so many signers with different strengths. So as I interpret, I have this in mind and I try to sign as visually as I can in a way that they might understand. Without the experience that I've had, I would just give it my best shot. But having seen how people sign in the corpus, I'm more aware of what they might understand. Research on Basindo is so important. This becomes part of how we convince other people about our language. They always ask, do you have any research, any data? The research that we've done in different regions helps to shed light on our language, Basindo. I remember in Makassar, we stayed with Ibu Ramia, she had a shop selling donuts and many deaf people came to the shop. We realized it was an opportunity. I had experience of running a deaf organization. So I gave a presentation to share knowledge with them and encourage them. To be honest, we know how important it is to support the deaf communities in the places where we have been doing our research, but we are aware of the challenges, the distances involved, but also the challenges of keeping in touch. And there has been quite a bit of miscommunication as we try to communicate by SMS. So uh, that's a lot of information to throw at you all. Um, lots of uh, thought provoking information. Uh, and they were talking about Elan in those clips, the data. Um, and that's the software we used for um, documentation, for the documentation of the sign language. And it had a huge impact on them because it was the first time they were able to watch things slowly and go back and it really provoked a lot of thought about the sign language. Um, and Mohammed talked about Makassar before as well, about trying to share that knowledge and trying to share his experience as well, um, linked with deaf organizations and developing. But also he was talking about the challenges and those challenges, for example, of, you know, Indonesia is so vast. You've got all these different islands and places. So the challenges are there in terms of geography, um, but there are some different activities that we, we did. So we organized um, two people from each of the six places that we went to. We organized um, some training and some research linked with ling linguistics, these workshops that we held. 
and we had um, we had a university in Jakarta, and it was the Akmajaya University in Jakarta. Um, so you can see here, this is where we went to the library. We had a look around, we did some research, we thought about that research and thought about why it was important. And then we looked at the data in Ilan and everything that we'd been able to capture um, to do that research. Uh, and the university lecturers uh, we invited as well to come from those um, six different areas. So they were also able to be part of looking at that Ilan data. So that's my presentation finished. Um, my presentation through five clips. I hope it's um, given you some idea of what I've been doing over these, um, these years and the research that I've identified through this. I'd like to say thank you very much to Joey uh, Lovestrand for inviting me here to deliver this presentation. And it's also really important to thank the Indonesian deaf community and the people who've been such a help um, such as Mohammed and lots of other people as well who've been involved in helping me along the way. And I'd also like to thank you all as well for uh, participating in this. Um, I have an email here on that last slide. You're more than welcome to contact me with any questions. Um, but now hopefully we can have a discussion and a question and answer session. So I invite questions from you all. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Nick, that was great. Really good to see more of your work and to hear from the Indonesians you've been working with about what they think about the work too. That was really insightful. We have a few questions already. Um, so some here in Zoom and at least one on the YouTube. So let me put a Lillian's question here in the chat. Uh, just looking at Lillian's first and third question together, she asked, is Basindo or ASL taught in schools? And related to that, what's the Indonesian government commitment towards Indonesian sign language? So thank you, uh, Lillian, for that, for that question, that first question. Um, just to let you know, in most schools in Indonesia are oral. So the teachers don't use any sign language at all. So that's why, um, you know, the teachers themselves don't really have any opportunity for training um, for any sign language um, acquisition and knowledge. Um, some schools have a dictionary, for, which is government provided. So there's a signing system which is provided from the government. So they've got that dictionary. And maybe some teachers will try um, to copy some of the signs from that dictionary. Um, but, you know, most deaf children in Indonesia don't have experience of any kind of education. Um, there's no access really um, to that. So it's very hard to understand, they find it very hard to understand what the teacher's saying. So if um, the child is in a mainstream setting or um, maybe inclusive school, maybe it's, it's deemed an inclusive school, it's very, very difficult for them to understand. Um, or maybe there's a deaf child that lives in a very rural setting, so they don't necessarily go to school. Um, because the parents don't know where to send this deaf child. Maybe they don't have that awareness and they think the child has a mental health problem or a learning difficulty um, and they're labeled stupid or, you know, and they might be embarrassed. They might not want them to go out into public. So I know of one school that uses Basindo at uh, one school that used Basindo. Um, some have strong Cebu, which I was talking about before, which was the government sign system. Um, Cebu, sorry. Is that, does that answer your question? Does that kind of cover everything that you were hoping to find out? Well, Lillian says, thank you. So I think that's good. 
we'll go to. Um, yeah, the um, second question I can see there that's popped up. Um, you know, Basindo really, um, you know, new signs are created all the time because obviously you have new technology and technology moves on. Things are invented. iPads, phones, apps are invented. So, for example... So Instagram, for example, Instagram, the sign is this, Instagram, Instagram, uh, because it's the I, the I letter G, uh, and it's from the American um, I and G. And then this, because maybe because you use photos. So it's that camera motion, which is captured within the sign for Instagram. So you can see you have partly iconic signs, um, but also based very much on finger spelling as well with the hand shape. So that's one way that new signs are created, but are they always linked with finger spelling? Absolutely not. You know, there are very many different ways that signs are created. Uh, the third question, I'm just looking at this, um, the Indonesian government, the attitude um, of, to, of the Indonesian government towards Basindo. And I think for many years, the Indonesian government just didn't have a, that awareness that they had Basindo. Um, they didn't have that awareness that it had its own grammar, its own lexicon, um, its own lexical um, dictionary and so on but recently um, they've become more aware and there's one law uh, which is now um, Basindo and CB um, and both are enshrined in the law so it means now that there is this slow kind of awareness, this developing awareness within the Indonesian government that, that, that they have this um, Basindo and it's been there for a long time. So I'm hoping that they will support it in the years to come. And maybe some of you know that the Indonesian government, um, the most important thing in the, in the government is um, language and literacy and so on and that is the, the the number one so if we can convince the government of that that deaf children can learn and they have that capacity to learn the language through Basindo I think um, that would be a breakthrough and I think that would create the success that we need so are there any more questions so well, I just pasted one in the chat, yeah, from YouTube, if you want to look at that one. Yeah. Yes. So I can see that, yeah. I'll read it just for everyone else to, in case they're not looking um, at the chat. I'll see it. I'll, I'll, uh, so talking about completions and mouthings of completions, um, but just asking about gesture, as well um, to show completion. So my response to that is I've not really noticed anything mouthing gesture wise. I'll just explain the difference um, for clarification. So you've got mouthings, which is based on the spoken language or the spoken word. So for example, um, I showed you before, Suda, Suda. Uh, being finished already. Um, the mouth and gesture is a little bit different for completion. Um, that's only in sign language. It's not, it's not from the spoken language, like pa or bu, bu or pa or fi, which you can see on my mouth there, but there's no uh, link there with the written or spoken language. It's it's sign language's own gesture, mouthing gesture. So I know I've not actually um, talked about this yet, but in Bali, you've got a different sign language 
Um, there's one village that has its own sign language, um, which is broken away from Basindo, um, completely separate to Basindo. And that sign language has mouthing gesture uh, and they're very clear mouthing gestures linked with completions and they show completions. I think pa, pa is, um, is the completion. So there may be other signs as well, or ba, and that shows whatever it is, has been completed, has completed. I don't know if that person, um, if you have noticed anything yourself, because I know you do research yourself in this particular field, so maybe this is an area you have knowledge of yourself. Maybe we can take one one last question, the question from Suzanne in the chat. She's asking about the uh, mention of transmission of sign language in Ambon that was interrupted by the Civil War. The question is, does this relate to different grammatical structures in the vision of variety in Ambon in the sense of creolization or a second language acquisition phenomenon that simplify grammatical structures? It's such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I know Suzanne, uh, Suzanne, I know well, and um, she loves Creole, and she's, you know, we, we've had many dialogues over the years talking about um, spoken language and sign language and Creole. Um, so are you talking about the effect of the war um, and the effect on the structure I mean, to be honest with you, I don't really know. I think a lot more research is required in that uh, field um, because I know in terms of language transmission, it has been affected in Ambon. So older deaf people fled. Uh, young deaf people had no contact with the older, with the elders in their deaf community. So I think it meant that maybe young sign language users were more influenced by um, their education. And, and I have seen that before as well, because um, you know of, of the contact I've have had with different people in Indonesia. So, uh, you know, they might be using a structure that's more simple or not, I don't know. Um, it's, it's difficult to say, but I think more research is needed. Um, they might be using something that's more similar to Indonesian spoken language. Someone's asked a question about what exactly is SIBI, SIBI. And I'll just explain that, uh, just to respond to that question, because I hope uh, by now you've realized that the sign language grammar and spoken language grammar are completely different, completely different. But SIBI is uh, one example of a group of it's a sign system. It's not a sign language. It's a sign system with the aim of um, taking the grammar of the spoken language, that dominant spoken language, and adding signs. So it means that uh, it doesn't have the uh, order of a natural sign language. It doesn't use space. It doesn't use facial expressions. Um, it has one sign for every um, morpheme. So in the written language. So it means really actually it's very difficult to use because sign language has its own way of very cleverly showing um, things, you know. So like I said before that, that example, it was shown three simultaneous bits of information. You know, people have all sorts of ingenious ways of expressing things beautifully in a very natural way. And if you try to do that with SIBI using a sign system and having different signs for each morpheme, it would become very heavy and impossible to sign. And also you wouldn't have the speed that you have in a natural sign language. 
So there are um, others as well, other signing systems that have been created by hearing people, by governments, by teachers, um, which means you know, the linguistic rights, there's an issue over the linguistics, linguistic rights though. Um, so I very much believe in strongly respecting the, the rights of the deaf person and of their own natural, beautiful, visual languages. And Indonesia has been trying to use this SIBI system for many years, I think almost 30 years now, and they've failed. It's just not been established. It's not been used by deaf children. It's not been used in literacy or any other means. But thank you so much, Nick. I think we're a bit over our time, so we'll end there. But thank you to you for, sh for the work you're doing and thanks to all of your collaborators for giving us this insight into what's happening in the Division Sign Language. Thank you also to Sarah for being with us today. We really appreciate you making uh, this presentation possible for all of us to understand and follow. Thanks to everyone who came and joined, those who asked questions and those who learned. Uh, yeah, we hope we'll have more opportunities to hear from Nick in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. I just want to add a, a thank you to the interpreter as well. Thank you.